So you'll recall back at the beginning of April, Congress voted nearly unanimously to support some stay-at-home measures. At that time, new coronavirus infections were reaching about 35,000 a day. But the priorities of congressional leaders seems to have shifted, despite the fact that we are currently seeing well over 60,000 new coronavirus cases a day. In a new piece called An Economist an economic survival package, not a stimulus package. One economist says this next stimulus piece could be a matter of life or death for millions of Americans. Dean Baker, a senior economist and co-founder of the Center for Economic Policy Research, joins us to explain what Congress should be including in the coming stimulus bill and why. Dean, thanks for being here. Well, thanks a lot for having me on. So one of the things I think was really important about your piece is that what's being lost, I think, in a lot of these discussions on Capitol Hill is that, again, this isn't a stimulus. This is a response, a congressional response to an unprecedented crisis in America. But to that point, you know, we, we get wrapped around the axle, I think, a little bit of these institutional questions of how we deliver that relief. And, you know, you talk a little bit about how, how unemployment insurance, you know, isn't perfect and it's inherently unfair because it's dealing with people, you know, not everybody can quit their job or, or is at home. So can you talk a little bit about that dynamic that's going on on the Hill right now? Should there be more of an emphasis on alternative payment delivery mechanisms like direct payments versus unemployment insurance? Well, it's been very interesting because we've had this big debate on the Hill where you have a lot of Republicans complaining that we're encouraging people to stay at home. And the strange aspect of that is I would, I would agree with them. We are encouraging people to stay at home because that should be what we want to do. As you just said a moment ago, we have three times, you exclude New York and New Jersey because they obviously were very hard hit back in March and April. You exclude them. The rest of the country, we have more than three times the infection rate today than we did back in, at the start of April when they apparently thought it was a good idea to encourage people to stay at home. So a $600 weekly supplement, um, yeah, you know, that's not fair. People are sitting at home getting it. Some people are working and sometimes working for less. That's not particularly fair. But in the scheme of things, it's still a good thing to keep these, give these people the option to stay at home. And one of the points that I think a lot of people lose sight of is people who have health conditions or family members who have health conditions. It really is life and death. If they get, if they get the virus, there's a good chance that if they don't die, there'll be a serious illness, maybe lasting effects, or someone in their family. So we have a lot of people we should want to stay at home. Now, beyond that, you know, what other measures? I actually think the, um, uh, I'm forgetting the exact initials, PPP, um, I mean, what they stand for, that, that gave money to employers to keep people on the payroll. I actually think that was a very good thing to do. It, it was awkward the way they did that. But what that allowed a lot of small businesses to do is keep people on the payroll so that when we do have the virus under control, they could quickly come back to work. Now, unfortunately, when they passed that in April, I and I think a lot of other people thought that date would probably be June or maybe July. Apparently, it's going to be a lot later. How do you assess what's at stake here? Because from my layman's look at the numbers, our economy has been um, dramatically propped up by the combination of the unemployment benefits and the initial direct payments that went out. Obviously, those benefits now have lapsed. Even if some miracle occurs and they come to a deal today, it's still going to be probably a couple weeks before those payments would be reinstated. Um, what does that look like on a person-to-person -person level, and what does that look like from a macroeconomic perspective? Well, we know an awful lot of people are living, you know, basically paycheck to paycheck. That was true even before the the pandemic hit. And when those people lost their jobs, a lot of them literally had nothing. They couldn't pay their rent. We saw the huge lines at the the food banks. Uh, people couldn't buy their food. Um, the checks, when they did come through, which way too long delay in many many cases. That was able to keep them keep them going, you know, at least for the people getting them. Um, now that those are being cut off, and at the same time, a lot of moratorium on evictions, foreclosures, those are coming to an end. We have a lot of people at very serious jeopardy. Now, in terms of the economy as a whole, um, needless to say, that's going to cut back spending if people don't have money. Um, so, I, I'm frankly, I have to say, I'm less worried about that effect because I'm less worried about. You know, you know, what our GDP is going to be in the third quarter than trying to make sure that people have the money they need to pay their rent or at least they can't be evicted and that they could buy the food and other necessities they need. And that is a huge, huge problem right now. 
One of the things I was hoping you could touch on that you mentioned in your piece that I really haven't seen discussed in that many other places is the pharmaceutical side of this, which is that the government is paying a lot of these pharma companies to develop these coronavirus vaccines, but then on the flip side, giving you know the drug companies their patent on it for years and letting them charge astronomical amounts on the, on the end of it. So can you talk about that? Is that something that Congress should be paying more attention to? It certainly should. I mean, I, I and I think everyone should be very upset about the way we finance drug development in general. Basically, people don't, have no idea. We, we spend $500 billion a year on drugs. I mean, that's an enormous, enormous amount. That's about 2.2% GDP. It's about, about $3,400 per family in the country. It's an incredible amount of money. And without patent monopolies, drugs would be very cheap. We would almost certainly spend less than a hundred hundred billion a year. I mean, there are very few drugs that are actually expensive to manufacture and distribute. Now, the logic here, the justification is we have to give them a patent monopoly so that they could uh, have incentive to research drugs and to cover the risk, because oftentimes they'll hit dead ends. Now, in the case of the coronavirus. There are no risks. We're paying them up front. I, I picked Moderna as my poster child here. We've given them over $900 million. Now, if at the end of the day, instead of having a great vaccine, they end up with something that doesn't work or has bad side effects, no risk to them. They got paid already. So the idea that we would pay them all this money up front, take all the risk ourselves, and then give them a patent monopoly so then they could charge us whatever they feel like, that's, it's really kind of crazy. And when you hear all the, you know, obvious I'm in this camp, we're concerned about income inequality. Well, why on earth are we distributing, redistributing so much money from the rest of us to the drug companies? It's kind of mind boggling. Right. And at the same time, on the, the topic of income inequality, I mean, we've seen a few people, you know, not to pick up on, on Jeff Bezos, but Bezos and other billionaires have added many zeros to the end of their net worth during this pandemic, even as you have somewhere around 30 million Americans facing food insecurity, facing housing insecurity. What is going to be the lasting fallout from this? Well, it's going to be very hard to say. I mean, obviously, a lot will depend how the elections go in November. But I, I would love to see us have, and we've done this in times past, have like a special war tax that, you know, it, it's going to be too hard to try and track down everyone here that wrongly made huge amounts of money. But I think it would be a great idea to have, say, a special tax of, say, 10 percentage points tacked on to the income tax for very high earners and the corporate income tax, just a one year deal. Um, those get to be harder issues if you talk about making them permanent. But if you say it a one year deal, um, it's pretty hard for them to escape that. So I think that would be a very, um, very reasonable tax to take back at least some of these gains. Again, who knows, you know, try and track down what gains were fair, what weren't. That's an impossible task. But just say, look, we don't know. We're going to take 10 percent. And finally, what is the toll going to be on small businesses? Because as you pointed out, the PPP programs seem to keep some of them going, at least to start with. Quite a few are failing now. Permanent job losses are accelerating. We already have this economy that is so consolidated at the top with these giant corporate behemoths. What is the impact of that piece going to be? Yeah, we're seeing a lot of them wiped out, and that's why I wish that in this next round there would be more money for the PPP. Again, a lot of people have criticized and made good, you know good objections that you know some of it was poorly spent. It was an administrative nightmare, but we've been through the worst of that. So we are going to see a huge hit to small businesses, but at least if we got another round of PPP, I think that could minimize it. But there's no doubt uh, we're going to when we're finally out of this, we'll see many fewer small businesses than we had going into it. All right, Dean Baker, thank you so much. Great to have you. Thanks, Dean. Thanks a lot for having me on. Next on Rising, the Biden campaign is targeting blue-collar workers in states like Ohio, former stronghold for President Trump. Trump campaign is going to tell us their plan to try to hold on to those voters when Rising returns.